10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast, Episode 147. Hey everybody, welcome back to episode 147 of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast. Welcome back. If you are new to the show, my name is Nick Manella. I am the creator and host of this podcast where we try to give you a short and concise jazz lesson every single week to get you on the road to better practicing and becoming a better jazz musician. So this week is going to be our tune of the month, and this week we are going to look at There Will Never Be Another You, the great jazz standard. I've been thinking about this tune a lot lately. Before we jump into the show, just wanted to remind you that you can find all the PDFs to all 147 episodes by going to our Patreon page and pledging to become a Patreon member for only $3 a month. You get every single PDF to every single episode that we do weekly here, and you also get some other fantastic benefits. We've got just about 200 people over there signed up, showing their support, keeping the podcast coming at you uh, week after week. So if you're one of those people, thank you so much. And I have to welcome some new people this week. So I wanted to give a big shout out to the new Patreon subscribers, new Patreon members, new Patreon supporters. Thank you to Brian, George, and Thane. Thank you guys so much for pledging your support. It's only three bucks a month, and I think the benefits far outweigh the costs. So if you are a fan of the show and have been thinking about becoming a supporter, now is the time to do it. It really allows us to bring you more and more, including this week's episode where I write an entire etude for you and ship it out to you in every single key so that you can get started practicing the concepts that I'm going to show you this week. All right, on to the episode. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to be taking a look at the great jazz standard, There Will Never Be Another You, this week. And the reason I chose this tune is both that I love to play it. There's so many examples of some of the great figures in this music playing over this tune. So there's a deep well of knowledge already built over this tune. And the second reason that I chose it is because it has many of the chord movements and devices that are so common in jazz standards and really gives us a fantastic opportunity to practice some of our different sounds over turnarounds, over a circle of fourths movement, over the 2-5-1 progression, both major and minor. So this is a great tune to study all around for many different reasons. Okay, so what I've chosen to present to you this week is a sound that I absolutely love and it always happens over a five to one resolution. And again, we see that a lot in this tune, so we're gonna get to do it in many different keys and in many different ways, which is why I chose it. So the sound that we're looking for is the sharp nine to the flat nine over the dominant chord, and that resolves to the five over the one chord. This is an extremely classic sound that so many musicians have used. And the reason why it's so effective is because the sharp nine and the flat nine are two notes that have the most tension over the five chord, right? And they're also uh, found in both the diminished dominant scale, so the half whole diminished scale that we use over a five chord a lot of the time, and they're also found in the altered scale, which is another really, really awesome sound that we like to use over five chords a lot. So it's kind of like killing two birds with one stone when we practice this sharp nine to flat nine, and then that resolves to five. So let me show you what that resolution actually sounds like. I'm going to do it over concert E flat since that's the key that this tune is in. And then I'm going to show you the exercise that I've written out for you on your PDF this week, which is just taking advantage of all of those five to one resolutions and using sharp nine to flat nine to do it. But let's check out what sharp nine to flat nine to five sounds like first.
So you can hear that wonderful tension that happens when I'm using that sharp nine, flat nine sound, and then it resolves just so beautifully to the five over the one chord. And the nice thing about the five and resolutions to the five is that they work both over major one chords and minor one chords. So it's really the perfect concept to be working on over a tune like There Will Never Be Another You, where a lot of the one chords are of different qualities, right? The fifth does not change from major to minor. So it makes it a really fun concept to practice, and you can put it in so many different places. Okay, so what I've done on the first page of your PDF this week is I've just simply inserted that line that I just played into every possible place that you can over this tune. So for instance, there's one in measure four, there's another one in measure eight, there's another one in measure 10, there's another one in measure 12, and on and on and on and on. There's a whole bunch of different places where you can practice this. So I've written out the line everywhere it can possibly be used in a bunch of different keys. And what you're gonna do is you're basically just gonna rest where you're not playing the line. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna do a couple of things for you. It's going to first allow you to take in the sound of the chord progression, right? Because honestly, for most of the tune, you're resting. And that's actually a really great thing to do. We're so used to, when we're playing over a tune, just playing over every measure. But do we ever really stop and just listen to the chords go by? That can really change your playing a lot. It, it can really change your understanding of a chord progression by just listening to it. So this is the first thing that it's going to do for you. The second thing it's gonna do is you're literally just playing the same thing over and over and over again in all these cadence points. So you're really getting the sound of these note relationships and this resolution that we're studying into your ears because it's the only thing that you're playing, right? And you're gonna hear it like eight to 10 times over this tune. So it's gonna do a whole bunch of things for you and I highly suggest starting with page one of the PDF before you do anything else, before you go over and you check out the etude that I've written for you, before you try to do something way more fancy with this sound, just stick to the basics. Get the sound in your ears first. And even if you don't practice anything else this week, like if you don't go and try to further this concept in a bunch of other tunes and really learn it, I think that just playing through this PDF with a play along is really gonna help you out. Um, it'll at least give your ears something to think about, even if you are not fully invested in getting this sound into your playing yet. And then once you know what this sounds like, you're going to hear it all over your favorite records. So many people use this sound. So it's just a good thing to learn, even if you're not going to fully dive into it yet. All right, so now I'm going to play page one of the etude for you so that you can hear exactly the way that I would practice it. And you're going to hear this uh, sharp nine to flat nine sound just drilled into your ears all throughout the progression. Check it out. Okay, so hopefully you can hear that concept. I'm really drilling it into your head with that little exercise that I've written for you. Now, a couple of things happen in that. You will notice that anytime there's a one measure 2-5-1 progression, I'm simply just thinking about the five chord over it. So that ends up being some fairly dissonant notes over the two chord while it's happening. But again, what we're really trying to do is give the impression of that five to one. 
And that's really the important part. So I'm just substituting the five chord over the entire measure. Now also you'll notice at the end of the tune, I had to switch up the exercise a little bit because the chords are moving really, really quickly around that circle of fourths in the last four measures. So I just slightly altered the exercise to give me a bit of a different sound and to be able to fit that sharp nine to flat nine to five into any opportunity that I could over those last measures. So you could do a little bit of digging, you can do a little bit of uh, analyzing on those last four measures and check out what I'm actually doing now. So here's the thing, after you've played my exercise verbatim, I want you to go in and switch up the rhythms a little bit to your own Make it your own a little bit. Still use the exact same notes. You can still stay very, very close to what I've written, but I want you to actually come up with your own stuff over it rhythmically, okay? So let me give you an example of what that would sound like so that it doesn't just kind of, uh, so that there's no creativity in it. I wanna actually turn this exercise into somewhat of my own thing. Use my written material as a guideline and then do your own thing. So check out what it sounds like if I switch up the rhythm a little bit, but stick with the same notes. Okay, so you can hear I switched up the rhythm and I also added a few notes. Sometimes I just can't help myself. So you could do that as well. Tag the resolution a little bit with your own ideas. Make this exercise into something that actually sounds like music. All right, now the next thing that I've done for you is I've written a full etude over one course of this tune and you'll get it in B flat, E flat and concert pitch. Um, so that you can start to see this stuff in action with some other devices that I would actually use in a real solo. So really study this and see if you can find those sharp nine to flat nine resolutions because they're in there, but now they're just not as explicit as they are on page one of the PDF where I'm just using that stuff. So this should give you a good insight into how I would kind of incorporate that into other lines, but still center the sound around that. And this is how I would practice, you know, let's say that I work on my sharp nine to flat nine resolutions, and then I go and I play over a tune. This etude is kind of a good example on how I would try to work that sound into my playing. Not verbatim, but I'm just trying to get comfortable with it as a device. Being able to use it naturally is a really important skill to have. All right, so check it out. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure that you drop me a line, 10 lesson at gmail.com, or go to our Facebook community group, the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Community. You can just search for that on Facebook, get signed up, and we can have a discussion about this in that group. Let me know what you're thinking. I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you to everybody who is a Patreon subscriber. We could not do this show without you. And uh, if you want to go over and get signed up, you're going to get the PDF to this episode and every single other one that we've ever done. So make sure you do that this week. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Have a great weekend and happy practicing. Here is me playing over the etude on page two of the PDF.
Mm-hmm.